Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you so much for tuning in if you're joining us live. Um, I want to do a, a special welcome uh, also to Robert and Marjorie Webster, who will be tuning in today. Um, I'm Jonathan Wong, and uh, I'm the current president of the AUOA, uh, which is the Otago Alumni uh, Organization based in the United States here. Um, a quick plug for our, our, our group here. Uh, you know, we are a nonprofit based uh, alumni organization that's dedicated to supporting uh, each other that is Otago alumni and also providing a, uh, a vehicle for uh, US based alumni to contribute financially to the University of Otago. Um, I want to want to provide a huge thank you to both Miguel and James today for uh, for their time and insights. Uh, very, very excited for this webinar uh, and also to our moderators, Phil and Kath, uh, who are both board members of the AUOA. So with that, let me hand off to Sheila Murray, who is the Director of Development and Alumni Relations for the University of Otago. Thanks, Jono. Hi, everybody. Welcome from a cold um, winter stay in Dunedin. Though I must say it was a bit warmer today than it has been. Um, I'd just like to um, thank um, AUOA for um, helping to organise this uh, webinar today, and certainly James and McWill, who are part of the university staff here. Um, we certainly um, look forward to working more collaboratively with you guys on setting these up and moving these more forward. Um, so I hope it all goes well. And um, thanks to a couple of my team members, Danella and Laura, for helping get this put together today. Thanks, everybody. Have a good time. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Phil Graham. I've lived in the US 35 years and worked in the pharmaceutical industry for 30 of those years. Currently, I'm at a small company in the greater Boston area, and you see behind me uh, a view of uh, Boston from the Prudential Center for people who, who know the, the city. I recently joined the board of the AUA after attending an event at the New Zealand Embassy in Washington, D.C. last fall, where I very much enjoyed meeting the Chancellor, Vice Chancellor, founding members of the AUA, AUOA, as well as a number of other alumni. Through this event and others like it, we're hoping to maintain connection with American alumni and with the university. Today, we have presentations from two researchers at Otago related to the defining topic of our time, the COVID-19 pandemic. After both presentations are complete, we will have a question and answer session moderated by Dr. Kath Bollard, Professor of Pediatrics, Microbiology, Immunology and Tropical Medicine at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, DC. You may ask questions at any time via the Q&A function, which you can access by moving the mouse to the bottom of the screen. We expect to finish at 7 p.m. Eastern time, 4 p.m. on the West Coast. In the event we cannot get to all the questions at the end of the hour, we will send them along to the presenters for an email response, which, will include, which we will include in a follow-up email, along with a link to the recording of this section, session. Our first speaker is Professor Miguel Quinones Mateo, who holds the Webster Family Chair of Viral Pathogenesis at the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. He has over 25 years of research experience in the virology field and has authored over 100 peer-reviewed publications, nine book chapters, and more than 190 abstracts for scientific meetings. Today, he'll be talking about COVID-19 research in his laboratory at Otago. Thank you, Phil, for the introduction. Let me see if I can do this. Um, sure. And I'm gonna make this. I hope that that's okay. And then everybody's seeing the, the first slide. Uh, so first, thank you for the organizer for the invitation and thank you for the University of Otago Alumni Association for you know, attending today, uh, it's, it's been a, a pleasure. Um, uh, quick background, I'm um, originally from Venezuela, moved to Spain to do my PhD, moved to the US for many years, and I've been here in New Zealand for the last uh, almost 18 months now. And the plan was to start working with emergent viruses that could be relevant for, for New Zealand. Um, and I couldn't even imagine ever in my wildest dream that I was going to be in the middle of an outbreak and a pandemic like the one that we have right now. So today in the next you know, 15 to 20 minutes, I'm, tell, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of how we started working with these vitals um, and what we have been doing for the last you know, three or four, actually five, five months. 
So I'm going to start with how, uh, talking a little bit about the, the, give you an update about COVID-19. I mean, everybody's familiar with this John Hopkins uh, little map. And uh, as of yesterday, we're approaching 15 million people infected, uh, or at least detected, that have been infected with these uh, virus. And unfortunately, we have uh, roughly, you know, 600,000 people that have died. And these numbers keep increasing every day, which is, which is really, really sad. So fortunately for us in New Zealand and for other countries around the globe, but mainly here in New Zealand, we were able, as a country, able to control the pandemic uh, and the outbreak uh, with a minimal number of, you know, total confirmed cases, roughly 1,500, uh, and then a really, really limited number of people have died, unfortunately, 22 of them. Uh, uh, that's not a case for many other countries, including the U.S., as you can see here. Um, uh, Brazil, South Africa, India, you know, even Russia. Uh, this keeps increasing and increasing. So um, uh, we're desperately need of something to, to, to fight back. And I'm talking about vaccines or antivirals. So about how we started here in, in New Zealand, it's, 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 a, you know, it's kind of a funny story, to be honest. I was actually in Fiji um, on vacation with my family, with my daughter and, and a wife. And then and somebody told me, I think one of them told me, they said, have you seen what's going on in China? Uh, and and I, the right away, I said, well, this, this doesn't look that good. I mean, hopefully they're going to be able to contain it. So we went back to the meeting, and, and I think it was the same week that we came back on the next week, that James came to my office and, and with the same question. He said, Miguel, have you seen what was going on in China? Do you think that we should be ready for this? Uh, James, knowing that, that, that I have some background and you know, molecular, um, developing molecular diagnostics uh, kits and assays. So I, I agree, we, we decided at that point, this is mid-January, that we should be, you know, looking around and, and see what we can do to, to be ready in case that virus escape. Uh, I think at that point, uh, there was even one case in Australia or something like that. So quickly we decided that we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. And let's see what other people were doing out there. And, and try to adapt and implement uh, an assay that we could run here in the new and and be ready, like I said. So we found this, this group in Germany that online that they, were the, that they had developed these tests, uh, basically a quantitative real-time PCR, uh, to diagnose uh, infection with this SARS coronavirus too, that at the time was called human you know, Wuhan uh, coronavirus. So anyway, we ordered the primers. Of course, we didn't have any positive control, so we needed to order plasmid, to, you know, synthetic genes, and we ordered for the E gene and the, uh, um, the, the polymerase of the virus. So this is, you know, uh, the last week of, of January uh, 2020. So we got everything, and we here in my lab, we started, you know, working on the assay, being sure that, you know, that it worked like that. that the German group said that it was going to work, and this was a, the work of a, a, one of my, uh, you know. Uh, postdocs here in the, in, the, in, the, in my group, Blair, uh, Dr. Blair Lowley. So Blair did an amazing job of putting all these together, testing, you know, checking the sensitivity and specificity and so on of, the, of, the, of these assay, and it was more working really well. And at that point, then we engaged with uh, James' group in the Beginning Hospital with Dr. Jenny Grant, and we started, you know, implementing the assay in the hospital using the Panther Hologics, which is one of these massive intro, in, intro, in, instruments um, that, you know, you do all these testing basically automatically, get the sample in, do RNA extraction, PCR, and, you know, spits out the result at the end. So the idea was to, you know, take these in-house assets and implement it in the hospital and, and like that. So Blair and Jenny worked really hard for the next, you know, three or four weeks putting all these together. Uh, we tested, of course, the reproducibility of the assay. It was way more sensitive for the E gene than for the RDRP. Uh, and I'm sorry, I think that that's my phone that is ringing and I'm gonna unplug it. Uh, this is live TV. Uh, so the reproducibility was really, really good. Um, we tested, of course, that, you know, well, we were, the data that we got in a hospital was similar to the one that we were getting here in-house, uh, and it was working really, really well. Um, so at that point, uh, everything was set up. Uh, they went live in the hospital uh, that day, March, March the 13th, and James uh, and Jane were able to detect the first case in the needed actually, of, of you know, SARS coronavirus to infected person. And I think if I remember correctly, it was the eighth person in New Zealand. The other ones had been detected in Auckland. 
So we were, as you can imagine, and, you know, a, a mixture of worry, but uh, of course excited about, you know, that, that we were ready. I mean, that, that, that conversation that started six weeks before uh, paid off. Um, so Jenny and James continue working on these. We sent, or they sent samples to other, you know, institutions across the country just to be sure that our assay that we put together was working like it's supposed to. 100% concordance, everything was, went fine. Uh, so since that day, uh, they have been running that test in the hospital and, and have been monitoring these, these uh, outbreak, this pandemic in the South Island using that test, which is pretty cool. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you uh, what, what we did or the, the, the kind of you know, numbers that we got for the first month after the, the, the assay went live. As of you know, the 10th of April, we had at that point a little bit more than 1,000 cases in, in, in New Zealand, and roughly 200 of them were in the southern districts, including, of course, the leading uh, and Queenstown. All, all of them, if I remember correctly, most of them, if not all of them, were you know detected using our test. Um, and regarding the, the demographics of the people that we were tested, um, roughly, you know, 400 or 4,700 uh, people have been tested by, by the 10th of April, um, you know, kind of half and half between male and female. Uh, and then the age group basically reflects, you know, the demographics of the need, you know, definitely the Southern Island. Uh, 190 of those uh, 4,700 were positive for COVID-19. Uh, again, roughly, uh, you know, 52 to 47 uh, percent female to male. And as you can see here, this reflects the demographics of, of the need, and then mainly students, and you know, a little bit of older people like me here in, in, in the need. Not a big, not a statistical significant difference between male and female, and, and so on. So, because of the hologics, the Panther hologics was able to do SARS and other respiratory viruses, and Jenny and James were testing for other viruses as well. And none, of, at least at that point, as of the 10th of April, none of the viruses that were, or the samples that were positive for SARS coronavirus were positive for any other respiratory virus in, in that instrument. 54 of the ones that were negative for SARS were positive for other viruses, mainly influenza, but the other viruses, the typical respiratory viruses of the season as well. And, and, and the, the majority of them were negative for SARS and for the other respiratory viruses as well. Okay. But that was great. We developed the assay. It, it was working really well. And so when one we got it, I got a phone call from James saying that we got the first test that I mean, the first positive test. I said, okay, we need to sequence. We need to sequence that right away. I mean, we just need to verify that, that what we're seeing is, is what we're supposed to be seeing. So we got that sample that same day, and I think with the help of the, Dr. Joe Stanton and the, the Department of Anatomy here in, in, in the University of Ottawa, Jackson Trees, we processed that sample using the medium of for nanopore, and you know, basically a day later, uh, we got the data out, or we sequenced the full genome of the virus, um, and it was positive, of course, it was SARS coronavirus too. So the acid was working well, we were able to identify the first you know, virus I I here in New Zealand. Um, uh, but using sequencing. We got, uh, I think it was the same day or the next day, the second case. Uh, so I decided to you know, verify that using the MySeq and with the help again in the Department of Biochemistry and Blair in my group, we sequenced that in using the MySeq Illumina as no surprise, you know, positive as, uh, as well for SARS coronavirus too, the full yeah. genome as well. And of course, when we do the polygenetic tree, it was, you know, verified it was of course SARS coronavirus too and not, and not anything else. So at that point, uh, we were really excited. Um, everything was working. Uh, but of course, we, the, the country started you know, going into lockdown, uh, level one, two, three, and four eventually. So by the end of March, we went into New Zealand, went into level four lockdown. So everybody went home, as you may remember. Um, and I have to see, and I hate to talk about me, but <laughs> Uh, in, in first person, but I saw these as, a, as an opportunity. So okay, I'm a biologist, I'm supposed to be working in emerging viruses. We cannot go home. We need to keep this going. So I started talking with, you know, everybody here in the university. And at, at the time that everybody closed, I mean, all, any other university in the country closed and all the research went to stop uh, with the support of everybody from the VC, from Harleen, uh, from PVC, from Paul Brownton, and you know, the Dean, Brian, and, and our HOD, Greg Cook. Uh, everybody was supportive and I said, yeah, Miguel, you need to keep going and we need to keep working with these virus. So we went to talk about all the you know, guidelines, regulations, and everything. And we kept my lab and two postdocs 
uh, Blair and, and, and Roldi, I'll, I'll mention more about Roldi in a second. And since we have a PC3 lab, a uh, you know, physical containment tree laboratory, I decided that, okay, we need to, the next step is PCR sequencing. Now we need to isolate the virus. Everybody was doing it, uh, so we really had to do it as well. Uh, so at that point, we took um, um, a bunch of different samples from, from James in, in the hospital, mainly uh, nasopharyngeal swabs. Um, we took those and infected or exposed the virus cells to these samples, and we got seven viruses. And as you can imagine, that first week or, or 10 days of doing these, we were all very excited, waiting to see if this was going to happen. And we got some CPE, cytopathy effect, effect. It's okay, it looks like, I mean, uh, this was a hard work of Rodley, Rodley Harfoot, um, and has a plenty of experience uh, working with influenza virus in Memphis and St. Jude, um, you know, Kiwi, that went and did a, did a postdoc with Dr. Uh, Richard Webby and Dr. Robert Webster. And so he came back home. And, and he joined my lab, like uh, I would say, like four or five months before everything started. So it was perfect, perfect timing for me and for him and everyone. everyone. So at that point, we saw CPE, okay, seems that based on the sequencing and the PCR, it should be SARS coronavirus. Uh, let's go and check that. So we got seven viruses, supposedly isolates, um, and we sequenced them. And of course, just like, like, like before, all of them were SARS coronavirus too. But more importantly, uh, one thing that we needed to compare and uh, to verify was that the virus that we were getting from in, in the PC3 would match the virus that we got from the patient. And we did that, and it's a uh, you know, sequence of the full gene, and it was basically 100% concordance on all of them. So that, that was really good. Uh, we were in the right path. Uh, and now we have the virus. What, what, to, what, what, what do we do next? Uh, so but I've been talking you know, for a while now, uh, 12 minutes, uh, 13 minutes. Uh, but I haven't introduced the virus, and at, at, at this point, everybody, I'm sure that you're sick and tired of listening to about SARS coronavirus too. But I'm just going to introduce you here briefly. It, it's a uh, you know, single uh, positive uh, the, um, RNA virus. Uh, the genome is roughly 30,000 you know, nucleotides. Uh, have a bunch of different structural proteins, uh, but the most important, I mean, at least for me, and I, I, a lot of people will agree, is the spike glycan protein, which is the one that you know allows the virus to uh, bind to the receptor, to the ACE2, and enter the cell, and is the main target for neutralizing antibodies. Talking about vaccine development, that James is going to tell you a, a little bit in a second. And so why, why I'm saying all this is because. Just like with other, any other virus, and, and this is, you know, reminds me of HIV in the early uh, 80s and 90s, when we started sequencing all these viruses and we started seeing differences, slightly difference in the phylogenetic trees, and it could be resembled kind of clades and clusters, and that could or not uh, provide different, you know, phenotypic differences, and you know, people have been talking about increased virulence or transmissibility, or the virus is mutating and it's making it more pathogenic. So there is a lot of groups out there collecting all this information and collecting, putting together these nice figures. So, so that's 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 really nice. So what we did, our seven isolates, uh, we did again. We just compared it with everything else that is out there. And we found now that out of the seven, uh, um, and we have basically four of these different clades or clusters that people have been defining, two, 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 and one of them, and what is called GH, G, D, and L. So it's basically telling us that the multiple introductions of these different viruses into New Zealand. Um, and I'm not going to tell you more too, too much about these because this is not the focus of my lab right now, sequencing all these. This is an amazing job that uh, Gemma Gigan from our, our our, law, our department actually here, in, in, together with the ESR here in New Zealand, they're sequencing all 1,500 isolates that we have here in New Zealand. So they're doing an amazing job, and I'm sure that we will see more of these data uh, soon. So why I'm showing you all these is because people, uh, and these are the different mutations that we have seen, that, that we saw in a different, you know, isolates that we call this different seven in the full genome. So there is not that much compared with any other RNA virus that we see out there, you know, influenza, for example, or HIV or hepatitis C, the, the, the virus is not mutating that much. It's not changing that much. It transmits like crazy, but it's not changing that much. But there is a lot of people that have been talking about these particular mutation, the D614G uh, in the spike. And some people say that it increases the replication capacity in cell culture, or that maybe increasing transmissibility that is replacing the, the wild type, the one without the mutation. Uh, and it could be real. I mean, there are a couple of papers that are showing that. 
Um, um, and there are a few papers showing using xenotype viruses that it, it seems that it is infecting better in vitro. Uh, so we took our seven isolates, and three of them didn't have that mutation, and four of them, they do have it. And you see vio cell lines, um, which is a cell line, it's not primary cell. We didn't see any difference at all. We're repeating these using primary cells, and of course, with the cavity, it's only seven of them. But, but I, I'm not sure if the, these virus transmit and infect so well that I don't know if a single mutation will be responsible for this increase in transmissibility. This could be a final effect, and, and I'm sure that a lot of you will have questions, and we can talk more about that at the end. With the help of Dr. Mingda Bostina here in, in our department, uh, of course, the next step we took that virus out. We need to see it under the microscope, and uh, he did an amazing job uh, doing electromicroscopy. Uh, of course, we see the virus, you know, particles uh, over there. Uh, so, what's next? What, what do we do now? Uh, we have the virus, you know, that man's, we're publishing a really nice paper about the characterization of these virus in New Zealand, the, the ones that are circulating here. But what do we do with that now? So if you remember at the beginning, we had a problem because we didn't have positive controls to test, uh, you know, anything, all the, the different diagnostic kits and assays and so on. So because we were able to order those plasmids, synthetic genes, we were able to do it. So one of the first things that we did when we, once we isolated the virus was purify RNA and start sharing that RNA with clinical labs and all other academic institutions and companies. So they will have that positive control to test everything and we continue to do that. In fact, we're sharing RNA and we've been sharing virus, uh, inactivated virus uh, at, at, at this point. We have been involved in, you know, in several uh, uh, projects related to COVID-19 diagnosis. Uh, Dr. Joe Stanton, I mentioned before, she's doing an amazing job developing a point of care test. Uh, we're involved with another company, uh, another institution developing uh, potentially microRNA based diagnostics. Um, we have a, a, a really, this is a really exciting project uh, supported by the MBE um, about disinfection and reuse of personal protective equipment uh, with, together with Dr. Ivan Anderson from the University of Auckland. And we are participating in uh, different clinical studies, you know, uh, using convalescent plasma or even uh, the, the effect of, of COVID-19 in the brain. On top of that, as you can imagine, and uh, I just checked yesterday, actually, there are 322 different drugs or compounds that are being tested. One third of that, or two thirds of that is in human trials right now. But you can imagine everybody wants to test something about this virus. We're testing anything from manuka, oil, <laughs> and, and honey, uh, to you name it, you know, small molecules. So everybody wants to test something. And the fact that we have the virus, that we were the first ones who isolated in New Zealand, we have the, the capability in the PC3, and we have plenty of different projects doing this uh, at this point. And, and of course, Again, having the access to the virus, uh, the, the ability to grow in, in, in the PC3, we have been collaborating, and, and James will tell you more about these vaccine development pl uh, plans uh, here in, in New Zealand. So on that note, uh, one minute to go, I just wanted to acknowledge everyone in my lab, especially Blair and Rodley, of course, my lab manager, Dr. Nero Hernandez, Joe, Robert, I mean, everybody that I mentioned before, uh, the Institute, uh, um, the IBSC, in, in, and Megan Coleman for all, you know, helping us with the PC3, and of course, the funding support, uh, both the University of Otago, the AB, and a great, great shout out to the Western Family Chair, and to Jenny, so that just basically helping to do these from, from the very beginning. So on that note, I'm going to uh, pass it to James and we can talk more about questions later. Thank you. Miguel, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to quickly introduce James. Um, he's uh, the, an associate professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, whose research interests include applied in molecular immunology, medical microbiology and vaccines. He's a medical graduate from Otago, has a PhD from the University of Auckland and undertook his post training at the University of Oxford in the UK. Returned to Otago in 2013 to a joint clinical appointment working as a clinical microbiologist. Today he's going to speak to us about the various approaches being used to develop COVID-19 vaccines around the world. James. Great. Thanks, Phil. I'll just try and share the screen. wait for the uh, spinning circle of death. 
There we go. So hopefully everyone can see that okay. So yes, yeah, so thanks for the introduction. So I'm going to talk to you today about, uh, give you an update on where things are at uh, with uh, vaccines for SARS-CoV-2, the cause of uh, COVID-19. So uh, as uh, Phil mentioned, I've, I've got a joint academic and clinical appointment. So I'm an associate professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Otago, and I'm also a clinical microbiologist at the Southern Community Laboratories, um, in, based here in, in Dunedin, um, and uh, also the director of the Webster Centre and um, for Infectious Diseases, and I'm very uh, pleased to see uh, that uh, Professor Webster and uh, Robert Amadri are here to listen today. I'm uh, very uh, honoured by that. Thank you. So I, I won't go into this uh, too much, uh, as Miguel has already covered it, um, but uh, obviously a popular first slide for talks. Um, but uh, just to highlight the, um, the I'll just move that off because that's probably on the, on the screen, uh, the exponential growth and uh, some of the countries that have been um, hard hit, including um, America and, um, and uh, parts, of, uh, parts of Europe. Um, whoops. So this re really highlights the, um, the, the need for a vaccine. There was some talk uh, early on about uh, achieving herd immunity through um, slow, uh, slowing infection in the community and allowing an, an infection to, to spread and controlling uh, admissions to hospital uh, while um, uh, rather than uh, waiting for a vaccine. Um, but uh, just to highlight uh, that that's not looking like a, a very good option uh, based on data to date. So Spain, is, uh, there's been a recently published, just come out in the last uh, week or so, uh, seroprevalence survey. Um, this hit the news a little bit earlier, uh, but they looked at the end of April and the start of May at the seroprevalence across Spain, uh, took a very uh, rigorous epidemiological approach, looked at over 60,000 participants and uh, found only 5% um, of the population uh, were, had evidence of antibodies uh, to SARS-CoV-2. This was despite over 200,000 um, confirmed cases and uh, 18, over 18,000 um, deaths. And, and those confirmed cases are probably an under, undoubtedly an underestimate. Similarly, uh, Sweden, which has uh, uh, been taking, uh, been following a, a herd immunity approach. Um, while this hasn't been published yet, um, there is uh, data out there uh, to suggest that at the end of April, where they'd had over 20,000 confirmed cases and almost uh, 3,000 deaths, that only 7.3% of Stockholm um, had antibodies uh, to, uh, to against SARS-CoV-2. And now things have progressed in Sweden, they've got almost 80,000 cases and over 5,500 deaths. Um, so despite a lot of pain um, and a lot of um, morbidity and mortality, uh, still low rates of seropositivity in, in the community. And if we look at the death rates in uh, um, some countries, um, we can see that the uh, almost uh, approaching one in two thousand, over one in two thousand people have died in um, um, some countries in uh, Europe, UK, and Spain. Uh, USA is approaching that. Uh, Sweden is also um, uh, in that realm. And in New York, there's a staggering uh, death rate uh, with over one in two hundred and fifty-eight people in New York has uh, died of uh, COVID-19. Whereas, uh, interestingly, the countries near Sweden uh, that have taken a very different approach where they've tried to control um, infection through lockdowns um, have seen much lower uh, uh, death rates. So a key question, um, both from a question of uh, herd immunity, uh, whether herd immunity might work if uh, through either natural infection or through vaccination, um, is whether um, immune response can protect against reinfection. So there was an informative recent publication uh, that came out in Science, uh, where they looked in, uh, in rhesus macaques and non-human primates uh, that had been infected, which they infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, in the laboratory, and when they infected them, uh, uh, with, uh, they then re-challenged them uh, with SARS-CoV-2, uh, after 35, um, 35 days after infection, and at the point of um, point, it, they could see a rise in neutralizing antibodies. They could see um, uh, T cell immunity as well. So CD4 T cells um, and CD8 killer T cells that are able to kill virally infected cells could all be in, uh, detected um, after um, uh, after the initial challenge. 
um, so prior to uh, reinfection, and then they rechallenged them day 35 after uh, primary infection. Um, and those uh, monkeys that had been um, inf had been had had that primary challenge um, uh, while they were still infected uh, with those with the primary challenge we saw for higher viral loads. While some of the monkeys were still infected, most of them we saw no virus uh, was seen um, in the nasopharynx upon rechallenge, um, and uh, that's uh, quantitated here. So a few monkeys were infected, but most were protected against reinfection day 35 post-primary infection, and there was an increase in um, antibody responses, um, including neutralizing antibody responses um, and in, um, in T cell responses against the virus. So this suggests that at least at this early stage, um, 35 days after primary infection, that uh, the non-human primates that uh, were protected against uh, a subsequent infection, although some of them did shed some virus um, at this early stage. And there's no convincing cases reported in the literature yet of uh, people being uh, reinfected uh, with SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS either. However, this does remain a concern. So if we look at the human endemic coronaviruses, of which there are four, um, so there's some early trials. Um, this one from, um, published in 1990, where they looked at a challenge uh, model. So they took some healthy volunteers. So these viruses normally cause a, a common cold. Um, and they took 15 volunteers and they inoculated them with, the, uh, with this uh, uh, HCOV-229E and they were able to infect uh, 10 of them, eight of them became symptomatic um, and they could measure an immune response to them. They then re-challenged them a year later with exactly the same um, virus of, the, of those who hadn't become infected the first time, um, all of them became infected the second time. So. Uh, they, their protection uh, against the initial challenge hadn't lasted and one became symptomatic. And um, of those who had become infected the first time, um, six of them became reinfected, although um, uh, none of them developed significant symptoms. So it does suggest uh, that there's concerns with the human endemic uh, coronaviruses that um, immunity is short lasting and uh, that uh, people can get reinfected. And there's a preprint that has just come out. This is sort of a, a heroic study where they followed people up, uh, 10 people were followed over 30 years and they collected um, blood samples and measured uh, antibody levels against uh, the human coronaviruses um, on a regular basis. Um, and they defined reinfection by a rise in, um, in antibody titers. Um, and they could show that uh, uh, for all of these viruses that there were frequent rises in antibody teeters suggesting um, reinfections. Unfortunately, there's no data on symptomatology, um, but uh, suggesting that on average, uh, or the, the median time between infections uh, with a, hu with a human cro endemic coronaviruses is only a, a, about 30 months, so that uh, immunity is short-lived short to these uh, coronaviruses at least. So what do we know about SARS-CoV-2? So there's emerging data uh, that uh, shows that antibody levels uh, decline, and this is being uh, replicated in uh, now in multiple studies. So this is a paper that was published in Nature Medicine out of China. Um, so looking at the levels of antibodies, so is a log logarithmic scale. So they looked at asymptomatic and symptomatic patients. Uh, symptomatic patients had a higher levels of um, antibody on the whole, but both asymptomatic and, sim and symptomatic patients, there was a decline in antibody levels between a month after exposure and then um, eight weeks um, after discharge from hospital. Um, and similarly, another study that's just hit the media in the last uh, week uh, out of the UK, uh, where they serially followed people, um, and uh, they showed that whether those who had very severe symptoms, so these are in red are the people who eat it up on invasive ventilation or on, um, or, or on bypass, um, or had severe respiratory failure, um, and black are people who uh, had less severe uh, disease and all pay, while there were higher antibody levels than those who had severe disease um, and all there was a decline in antibody levels uh, with time. So this is not unexpected. This has been seen um, after, uh, after other beta coronavirus infections. So the original uh, SARS virus which emerged in, emerged in 2002, 2003 and caused a a limited um, outbreak across a number of countries. Um, uh, there was also a decline in antibody levels seen. So this is looking uh, 
up to 36 months after um, onset of uh, disease. Um, and whether you're looking at um, total antibody levels or looking at neutralizing antibody levels, there's a drop in antibody levels and there's a drop in the percentage of people who are positive uh, for, uh, for antibodies. So uh, it's been seen with similar uh, viruses before. Interestingly, uh, T cell responses uh, seem to be uh, more persistent. So this is a paper that has just come out in, um, in, from, from a paper that's just come out in, in Nature. Um, and um, part of that paper, they looked at uh, antibody responses uh, again, uh, sorry, T cell responses against uh, the original SARS virus, and they could still detect them 17 years post infection. So they did this by a um, alley spot method, so stimulating the cells with overlapping peptides. So this, these are different patients along the x axis, and then looking at the number of spot forming units uh, producing um, interferon gamma producing T cells basically against different, t uh, different uh, parts of the virus. So they looked at the nuclear protein and saw abundant. Um, uh, T cell responses against nuclear protein across these patients, um, but not so much against non-structural um, uh, proteins. So you can st uh, still detect, uh, still detect uh, T cell responses sometime after infection. And we can certainly detect strong T cell responses in, in COVID-19 patients. So this is a paper out of La Jolla um, from Ale Alexandra Seti's uh, group. Um, and they uh, looked at overlapping peptides spanning the genome or the, uh, the proteome of uh, SARS-CoV-2. So this is the, the genome structure. Um, and here are the structural um, proteins, the matrix nuclear protein and the, um, uh, the spike. We see strong um, responses there. Um, again, um, by, this is by a different looking at different, di different method of uh, readout, but essentially still able to detect strong responses. Um, and uh, we also can see some lesser responses to the non-structural proteins, so dominated by the, the responses to the structural proteins. Uh, interestingly, they could also see cross-reactive T cells, <coughs> excuse me, in um, unexposed donors, and this has now been replicated by um, several different groups around the world. Um, and but the specificity of these T cells does seem to differ in that they seem to be more against. Uh, the non uh, to the non-structural uh, protein, some to the to the spike protein. But um, whether these reflect um, exposure, probably reflecting exposure to other endemic um, uh, human coronaviruses um, as well. And what the implications for these cross-reactive pre-existing T cells are for disease course um, and um, protection or for um, exacerbation of diseases is un unknown at this, this stage. So what do we know about vaccines for coronaviruses? So there have been um, uh, a, a number of vaccines that were uh, worked on uh, for the original SARS uh, vaccine and a couple got through to phase one uh, trials and were shown to be immunogenic, but unfortunately, well, fortunately the virus went away through public health efforts um, and um, it became uh, difficult to pursue these vaccine development programs and, and, and funding dried up. We've also seen the emergence of uh, MERS virus um, in the uh, 2010s um, and that continues in the Middle East and there's been three recent uh, vaccines that have come through to the uh, to phase one clinical trials uh, for, uh, for, for MERS and these were all published uh, this, this year. Uh, so the, we've got limited uh, data to date on coronavirus um, uh, vaccines. Some of the preclinical data does give uh, reason uh, for um, some pause and um, uh, reflection. Uh, so there is some reports from the original uh, SARS uh, vaccine work and with some vaccines and some animal models suggesting that there might be some vaccine mediated enhanced disease. So this is uh, one example of that from uh, uh, using a double inactivated um, uh, whole viral vaccine um, and they looked at an, an aged mice. Uh, so old mice are about a year old and, they, and then they vaccinated them with um, this uh, vaccine, this double inactivated vaccine with or without alum, um, and they could show partial protection. Uh, this is looking at weight loss um, in the vaccinated mice, um, and they showed partial um, protection against viral replication, whereas in, in young mice, they were fully uh, protected. And when they looked in these older mice, they could see um, evidence of infiltration of eosinophils um, into the lungs, and this was higher if they had received um, alum as an adjuvant uh, with that vaccine. 
um, and uh, they uh, they looked at uh, the cytokines that were being produced in the um, being produced in the lung, and they could see these sort of Th2 cytokines that might be driving this eosinophilic response. So, some concern that, um, especially in older mice, in, in older mice, um, and concern that this might be replicated in humans, that there might be um, uh, there's potential for the vaccine to uh, vaccine to worsen disease. There's also another method uh, or mechanism that has been postulated for enhancement of uh, vaccine uh, mediated enhancement of disease and that's from antibodies against the spike protein and this comes from non-human primate studies. So this uh, paper that was published last year, uh, they had a vaccine, uh, a vaccinia virus uh, vaccine that uh, produ uh, produced the SARS spike protein or they had a control vaccine um, and they could show they got good neutralizing antibodies and those neutralizing antibodies protected when they re-challenged, um, protected against um, infection um, in, the, in, in the nasopharynx, um, but they got worse um, histology score, histopathology scores um, in the lungs. And they could then show that if they, use, if they transferred um, uh, pre-immune sera um, into, the, into um, naive uh, rhesus macaques and then challenged them, they could show the same thing, that they could replicate uh, this uh, worsening of uh, histopathology, uh, suggesting that the antibody might be worsening um, uh, co the cause of this disease. Um, and the mechanism for that seemed to be um, by causing increased uh, production of pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, from various macrophage populations in the lung. So with those that got the control um, IgG, so that there was no pre-existing immunity, they mainly had uh, anti-inflammatory cytokine production with TGF-beta, uh, from, um, so from various macrophage populations, whereas in those that had had the, the um, pre-immune um, sera with anti-spike, there was a lot of IL-6 uh, pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine production. So concerningly, there does seem to be, well, there, there's been the observation that there is higher levels of neutralizing antibodies um, in, seen in severe disease um, versus those that have got uh, less severe disease. However, if you look at those that have got hyperinflammation, uh, so sort of high levels of the likes of IL-6, there doesn't seem to be, uh, this is in SARS-CoV-2, there doesn't seem to be any higher levels. So, so, so maybe uh, that what's been seen with SARS and, and non-human primates may not hold up in, um, in SARS-CoV-2 in humans, but um, we just, uh, we need to have some caution about that in, in vaccines. So moving along to considering what's happening with vaccines. So, uh, there's been a, uh, the, we, the traditional path for vaccines takes many years and uh, we might spend five to 10 years in preclinical development um, and then uh, another uh, 10 years um, going through uh, various clinical uh, testing to, uh, before we can deploy a vaccine and license it. And obviously a 15 year time frame at the moment has, is really not going to be acceptable uh, given the, the current global situation. So given experience that's um, from Ebola vaccine development, um, this timeline has been um, compressed with a lot of this preclinical testing um, occurring simultaneously along with uh, phase one testing. So this is safety uh, testing in, in small populations and um, some immunogenicity testing, and then looking at trying to conduct these larger studies uh, simultaneously um, and also pack um, starting the manufacturing process during the clinical testing um, uh, process as well. So there are a lot of vaccines currently in development. Um, so um, over, over 160 and some of these are uh, already in uh, clinical phase um, trials and, and one has been approved for use by the uh, Chinese army uh, or in the Chinese army. Uh, so these are a mix of traditional and novel methods. So we've got traditional methods such as inactivated uh, viral vaccines, um, uh, which um, have been, uh, for example, uh, influenza vaccines, an uh, uh, example of uh, that, or he hepatitis A. Um, attenuated viral uh, vaccines are uh, probably further down the track, but uh, and, and that they're further away. Um, but the examples of those that are currently in development, uh, they're currently in use, are like the measles, mumps, and rubella. And then the protein subunit vaccines and virus-like particles, uh, which we commonly use at the moment, such as the hepatitis B and HPV vaccines, um, are also in development. The, a lot of the early leaders are these um, novel vaccines, such as the viral vectored vaccines, 
Um, and uh, the only one of these that's currently uh, reached the clinic is uh, um, an Ebola vaccine that was uh, recently approved. And then RNA vaccines and DNA vaccines that are uh, also uh, where we're delivering a gene. So all of these are genetic vaccines that are delivering a gene uh, from SARS-CoV-2 um, to try and get that gene expressed in an, uh, an immune response against that. Um, but uh, none of these RNA or DNA vaccines have uh, yet to uh, reach a licensed product. So uh, from an inactivated viral perspective, that one of the leading candidates, a couple of leading candidates from China um, and uh, Sinovac are, are leading the charge here. So they've published their preclinical data in um, uh, science uh, recently, and they showed that it induced good neutralizing antibody responses uh, that were at uh, a higher level than those seen in uh, recovered uh, patients. Um, and if uh, with higher doses, uh, they could effectively suppress or largely suppress uh, viral RNA um, in the in the throat, um, and could thoroughly and could completely suppress it um, in the lungs. And importantly, even though they gave it with alum. Uh, no immunopathology uh, was seen. And they're progressing to phase one. They've completed apparently their phase one, two trials, although they haven't been published yet. Um, apparently they had good um, uh, responses and they're currently planning a phase three trial um, in Brazil. The um, other, uh, what the leading, probably the leading candidate at the moment is the University of Oxford and AstraZeneca's um, viral vector. So this is a chimpanzee adenoviral vector that is expressing the SARS-CoV-2 spike uh, protein that carries the gene for that. Um, and in the monkeys, they showed that it was able to um, uh, prevent pneumonia in those monkeys. So they, it suppressed uh, viral replication um, in, uh, in, in the lungs, in the BAL um, of fluid of those uh, monkeys and protected them um, against disease. So here the mock. Uh, monkey immunized monkeys when they were challenged they developed um, uh, pneumonia whereas that wasn't seen in the in the in the vaccinated monkeys but unfortunately um, they didn't manage to suppress uh, replication in the in the nose so this vaccine um, suggested that at least on the, with a single dose might be able to prevent uh, prevent disease but maybe not uh, prevent transmission um, although they did have a subsequent pa a paper where they showed at least in um, mice that you could boost with a homologous with a, a, a second dose at day 28 and you got higher levels of um, antibodies. So it might be that a second dose might be able to further boost those levels. Then hot off the press, uh, many of you all have seen that um, just published in the Lancet today, uh, the uh, phase one, two trial results have come out for this vaccine. So they looked at over a thousand healthy volunteers who got a single dose, apart from 10 volunteers who got a second dose at day 28, and compared to um, meningococcal conjugate vaccine. Um, and they showed that they got neutralizing antibodies um, in all of those, uh, all, almost all of the patients, all of the volunteers who received a single dose, um, and that those levels were lower than convalescent um, plasma samples, but in the 10 who got a, a booster dose, they got um, comparable levels uh, to convalescent plasma samples. And they also showed good T cell responses as well. Um, they're progressing, they've already progressed to phase two, three trials in the UK and phase three trials are also underway in Brazil and South Africa. So this is progressing at a rate. Um, the other leading candidate I want to talk about, uh, which there's been a lot of talk about is Moderna. So Moderna has uh, got a, a, a RNA vaccine. So this is uh, mRNA1273. It's a, in a lipid nanoparticle. Um, and it uh, basically encodes a pre-fusion stabilized spike protein and their preclinical data they showed good neutralizing antibody induction um, varied by the mouse speed, uh, strain that you gave it to um, and that it was able to um, protect against disease in a dose dependent manner. Uh, so uh, lower doses were sub um, uh, partially protective whereas higher doses completely protected against challenge. Um, and importantly, they saw no enhanced lung disease with those um, subprotective doses. And they've also just published um, phase one trial data that was in the New England Journal uh, last week. Um, and they showed that with two vaccinations, 28 days apart, that they got excellent levels of neutralizing antibodies um, that were sort of similar to convalescent um, uh, serum. Uh, unfortunately, their highest dose, the 250 micrograms, was too, too reactogenic, so that uh, won't be in, in subsequent trials. 
um, and their phase two trials are already underway um, and they've got a phase three trial plan for July. So that's one of the major challenges is uh, that part of the way there is developing a, a safer and a effective vaccine. We'll yet to see whether they'll be effective, but data to date's promising. Um, we then have to manufacture it um, and we have to scale up. Um, and this is perhaps uh, as equally a large challenge as developing a, um, a vaccine. So currently the, in the global market, there's, uh, uh, if we exclude seasonal influenza vaccines, there's three and a half billion doses of vaccines uh, made globally uh, per year. That's the, the current global capacity. And if we include seasonal influenza capacity, that's another one and a half billion doses in this pandemic surge capacity of 6.4 billion doses. Unfortunately, the influenza vaccine uses quite a different um, manufacturing process to many of these other vaccines. Um, and we're seeing that there's already um, uh, upscaling of manufacturing capacity uh, of uh, many of these leading candidates, uh, but we don't know which of these are gonna be successful and when they're gonna come online, but um, delivering these is going to be a, a major um, issue. Uh, there is a global push to try and uh, ensure equitable access um, to uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines as the, this uh, didn't occur very well with the previous uh, swine flu pandemic, H1N1, uh, back in 2009, 2010. Um, however, there are concerns about whether this will, uh, how effective this will be. We've already seen efforts from, um, uh, to try and purchase uh, leading vaccine producers to try and um, uh, secure supply uh, for particular countries. Um, and as reviewed in an excellent New York Times article recently suggesting that uh, the Serum Institute of India, which is one of the world's largest producers of vaccine doses, said that they would see most of the vaccine would have to go to their countrymen before it goes abroad. Um, and just probably the reality is that it's gonna be very hard for a government to allow vaccine produced in their country to be exported while there's a major problem um, at home. And we've seen in other spheres as well um, that, uh, um, that uh, equitable just there are going to be challenges to equitable distribution uh, globally. And finally, just um, manufacturing is only part of the problem. We then need to be able to deliver it as well. We need to decide who's going to get it first, um, how that vaccine is going to be stored, who's going to administer it, and this is going to be a problem on an unprecedented level when we're trying to deliver vaccine to an entire population, which is just far in excess of our current um, uh, um, current. Uh, processes. And there could be some additional challenges as well with particular um, candidates. For example, currently the Moderna mRNA vaccine needs to be stored at very low level uh, temperatures um, and has to be used uh, very quickly um, after thawing, uh, which is also going to provide extra challenges to delivery. So um, I'll stop there and um, if anyone's got any questions. Thanks very much, James. So we're now opening uh, this uh, excellent uh, panel discussion up for Q&A and we've had a few um, questions come through the chat. So I'm just going to, first one's actually uh, for Miguel and it was, um, could you talk a bit more about the effects of COVID on the brain that you mentioned briefly on slide 22? <laughs> this is a really good question, and, and like somebody said, when when a scientist says a good question, is 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 the same thing that saying I don't know. Um, it is this is in development, and we we know the uh, the virus can infect the neurons, um, but at least in my lab and what I've seen published by other people and what we have done here, we don't see any cytopath effect. We don't see any change. The virus is able to enter the cell, but it's not doing anything. Uh, uh, the cells can survive up to four weeks. Well, that's what we have seen. Um, people have been complaining, patients that recovered that have been complaining with some symptoms, uh, hallucinations, you know, fogginess, I mean, a, a lot of different symptoms. Uh, so this is an open field right now. Uh, with more and more patients recovering, we're gonna be able to, you know, find what's going on with the virus in the brain. Great, so, um the next question is sort of related to the immune system. So, I, James, you might want to answer some of these, but can you talk a bit more about the relative contribution of the spike protein antibodies versus the spike-specific T-cell responses? And is there any sort of 
evidence that immunity to one or both or you know, is more critical for clinical outcome in the acute and chronic periods? Uh, so, yep. So if we're thinking about patients who are infected um, uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, there, there is uh, probably both are important. We need um, neutralizing antibodies against uh, the uh, spike protein to uh, protect or to prevent infection of new cells and we need uh, T cell responses um, against uh, probably a broader range of um, proteins than the spike to, um, uh, to, to clear those cells that are already infected through cytotoxic T cell response or through T cell help. Um, I think it's uh, unclear at the moment how T cells might um, contribute, what the role of uh, T cell and antibody responses might be in contributing to um, uh, more severe disease. Um, that I think the, there's clearly more stronger um, antibody responses in, in patients um, and the quality of the T cell responses differs in patients who've got more severe disease. Um, but whether that's a result of more severe infection or whether contributing to the pathogenesis is unclear. And that data from that um, paper that's preprint from um, the uh, uh, Imperial um, suggests that uh, that I showed suggested that uh, at least while there are higher levels of an neutralizing antibodies and people with the most severe disease it doesn't seem to be driving the or associated with the hyperinflammation and that might be more of a um, innate immune uh, response and sort of in older people we see more of a pro-inflammatory um, bent uh, sort of an inflammaging uh, response as well so I'm not sure of that quite covers the question. But. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the problem is we just don't have enough information <laughs> yet. Yeah. And so actually that tees up to the next question because I think people are looking for the practical implications of watching a waning humoral response, mm. encouraging data that there might be long-term T cell immunity to SARS-CoV-1 in those patients that were infected way back. Um, so what's the implications for that with a vaccine? You know, is this something that the vaccines are predominantly targeting the humoral immune response? Mm. Is it going to have to be something that you have every year, like the flu vaccine? Does it really matter? Is reinfection a more benign disease? Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, so I think it's uh, unknown at this stage what the... Uh, durability of the um, antibody response will be with the different vaccines. Um, it may well be that boosters are required. Um, at the moment, it's, um, I think, from looking at all the data that's out there, I'm not convinced that we're going to see sterilizing immunity um, from uh, any of the vaccine candidates. I think, I mean, all the, the RNA and the viral vector vaccines all seem to give a similar, a roughly similar response. They're all sort of taking a, a roughly similar approach. Um, it may be that we need more antigens, a uh, greater breadth of antigen um, may, such as with the inactivated viral vaccine, may provide better um, uh, longer term protection. I, I don't think we know at this stage, um, but uh, so I think these these first um, these first generation of vaccines I think will likely provide personal protection, but I'm not convinced they're going to provide um, broad herd immunity um, um, that will uh, protect those who uh, haven't who refuse vaccines, which is another issue which I didn't um, touch on, but which I think is a massive. Uh, a massive issue is vaccine hesitancy and how we actually get a significant portion of the population to, uh, to accept vaccination. So it's a very good point in New Zealand, I have to say. <laughs> um, so since you two are some of the leading experts on uh, SARS-CoV-2 in New Zealand, um, you may be asked this question by your government. So if a vaccine does become available in the US before New Zealand, would you be comfortable advising your government to let us vaccinated US people into COVID-free New Zealand? 
Um, I, I can tackle that with a two second <laughs> answer. Um, I wouldn't discontinue what we're doing right now. Everybody coming to the border it should be checked. If you are active or positive, you have to go to quarantine and until proof that this vaccine is working. Um, it's too soon, we're doing so well right now here and the rest of the world is not doing that well that we cannot risk it. Uh, we live in our bubble and we're doing great. Uh, I, I wouldn't recommend that, to be honest. Until yeah, well, that's because that you're living working. in the bubble. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I, I probably concur with Miguel. I think until the vaccine's deployed in New Zealand, I'd be reluctant. I personally would be reluctant to relax border restrictions. So Miguel, maybe um, you can talk a bit about the implications of the mutations of the virus, which I believe are mainly within Spike. And are you concerned about that given that the vaccines are predominantly targeting Spike? Does this worry you? No, no, at all, actually. Uh, and we can talk about this for a long, long time. Uh, I, I've made my career of working with virus evolution. These virus is not mutating at all. Okay, this is basically, it, it has no reason to mutate. It's transmitting like crazy the way it is, why it's gonna mutate. The, the, what we're seeing right now on those phylogenetic trees that I show, or the minimum mutations, we're talking about five, six mutations randomly in the genome, in a 30,000 nucleotide genome. That's nothing. If you compare it with any other RNA virus without their proofreading inability that these virus have, that's nothing. So the virus is not mutating, it's not gonna become more pathogenic, it's not becoming more virulent. And what we're seeing with this particular mutation, the spike is, is just you know, genetic drift. It's, it's, it's a founder effect. Now, once we start deploying our vaccine and we start deploying drugs, that will be a challenge. We will need to see if the virus has an answer for that. And, and before we do that, believe me, that's what we do in the labs. When once before a Randesivir, I'm sure that people have been trying to select from drug resistant or Randesivir resistant virus in vitro. And the same thing will happen with the vaccine. So we'll, have to, we'll need to cross that bridge when, when we get there. But the virus, these virus doesn't mutate like in any other viruses. So there's another question, uh, another practical orientated questions. Um, a, um, a lot of emphasis has been placed on the use of masks in the US, as you know, it's become a politicized issue over here. Uh, so the question is, would you re recommend masks in New Zealand if God forbid the virus did enter the community again? Yes, I mean, I think there's emerging, well, I think there's now ample evidence um, that um, masks and social distancing are effective at controlling the community spread of, um, of SARS-CoV-2. So I think, I mean, we've seen it now. Melbourne, Victoria is now making masks compulsory. They're compulsory in the UK in certain situations. So um, there's already been, uh, uh, been discussion in the community um, or been discussion uh, pr previously about whether there should be masks uh, be used in New Zealand. So I'm sure that that will happen if there was community transmission. So next question is related to therapy that not so much was touched on about that uh, in your talks, but can one of you elaborate on the potential application and, um, and pathogenesis of uh, using the immune sera as a therapeutic? Uh, yep, there's limited data that I've seen to date, but so far it appears to be safe. Um, there's an issue with determining that there's adequate amounts of, I mean, as we saw with, the, I showed with the dropping neutralizing antibodies with time, that's uh, got to make, screen those donations and to make sure there's um, high levels of neutralizing antibodies and Miguel's been involved in that, but there doesn't seem to be any reports of enhancement of disease yet that I've seen in the literature. So I, I, I'm going to jump there because I, I actually I have a question for, for the immunologist, for James now, because I, I, I had this discussion yesterday with, with a colleague. So on this case, it, it, let's say that I'm treated with a, a convalescent plasma uh, and, and you know, that controls the vital replication. Does that mean that my immune system is not going to mount a response? It's going to go lazy and say, oh, I already got antibody for somebody else. I'm not going to bother making my own. Uh, and how that's going to affect the potential reinfection? 
Yeah, I mean, you're clearly, yeah, you're still going to have an immune response to clear the infection. Um, yeah. You will suppress the amount of virus, and this, in the more severe patients, there is more virus seen later in the course of disease, and it's probably contributing to the hyperinflammation that's seen in some patients. So, as I say, though, the, we yet to see good clinical data showing that um, that convalescent serum is. Uh, in a, in, a, in a good trial showing that it's effective. So the convalescent serum is basically buying time for your immune system to you know, pick up and, and get to the next, yeah. okay. Um, yeah, I have that. sorry, I hijacked the conversation. No, no, that's all right. So there is another question, is there a role for the therapeutics? So I'm guessing beyond convalescent serum, uh, the the only approved agent is really remdesivir, but maybe the question also is broadening about the hydroxychloroquine issue as well. Well, the, the, reality, <laughs> the reality is, without touching too much the hydroxychloroquine, <laughs> um, the reality is that every single pharmaceutical company in the world, institutional, I mean, you name it, everybody's trying to find something like you know, that is able to block the replication of these virus. Um, and believe it or not, the only ones that we've seen so far are Rendisivir, or this drug that was, well, Fapipiravir does a, a good job as well. Um, and this drug that was developed actually here in New Zealand, um, that is I'm blocking the name right now, James, can you help me? Um, Galacidilabir or something like that, uh, that he that seems to be blocking it too. Uh, it goes back to the proof reading ability of the virus. The virus, these particular RNA virus, is able to go back and fix any any mistakes made by the polymerase. Something that doesn't happen with the other RNA viruses. So when you use a nucleus analog of like norandesivir or any of these, the virus is going to be able to go back and fix it. So that's that's the challenge here. Um, so, but yeah, that that to me, other than developing a vaccine. Having an important antivirus that is going to reduce the, the, the symptoms, and then the patient is not going to die, is going to be a really bad call or go to the hospital. And, uh, that would be the key for me. And Rendisivir so far is the only one that we have. Yeah, so we need the Tamiflu equivalent. That's what I keep saying because we don't yeah. have Remdesivir is not the Tamiflu for yeah. SARS CoV 2. We with the caveat that the, the influenza can you know, re, uh, develop resistance against, against tiny flu. Correct. We don't want that for uh, this coronavirus. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Timing is also important as well. I mean, I think the point's been made that in the remdesivir trials, a lot of the treatment was started. I mean, the, the median time to starting treatment was quite late in the course, and that maybe better outcomes might be seen if it was uh, started early. I mean, we know that for other viral infections, such as influenza, you get a better uh, response if you start drugs earlier. But I agree. Kath, that um, especially if you're going to do that, you ideally want an oral drug that you can administer to lots of people. I mean, the other thing that's been shown to be effective is dexamethasone and those who need supplementary oxygen or uh, on ventilation, and that certainly seems to lower mortality by dampening the immune response. Yeah, so I'm gonna... say, uh, sorry, Kath, really quick. We learned, I mean, from the you know, 20, 30 years ago, that a single therapy may not be the answer. We may have to do a double, triple, triple you know, therapy to treat this, these virus. So I have one last question before I hand it back to Phil, and it's I'm asking it because it's actually relevant to New Zealand, and because I've had two BCGs va vaccines myself, plus I worked on the TB ward at Green Lane Hospital. So um, what do you think of the hypothesis that a BCG vaccine might be protective? Uh, for getting severe SARS-CoV-2 infection. Yeah, um, so there, I mean, the, so there is data around that suggests that um, BCG um, is uh, able to, to have some um, persisting effects on the innate immune response, so, so so-called trained innate immunity, uh, and but how long that lasts is um, uh, remains to be seen. So I think the early uh, early on in the in the outbreak in the pandemic, there was um, some epidemiological data that suggested that rates of infection and mortality were lower in countries that had B, had BCG vaccination versus those that don't. Um, I'm not sure that that held up. I don't think that's held up as things have spread. 
Um, I think, I mean, there's so many other confounding factors on that, such as access to diagnostics. Um, when things were introduced... And having a female Prime Minister is apparently also a prognostic, <laughs> positive prognostic. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I, I'm very dubious. I have to admit that BCG will have any um, particular effect, um, especially in adult populations against... But there are clinical trials underway. Um, and I think the other thing to say is that um, uh, if, if we want, we need to be clear that it's going to work before <laughs> we go down that track, because um, otherwise we're going to use up global stocks of BCG, um, and they're not going to be available for use where they should be used, such as in sub-Saharan Africa, preventing uh, severe neonatal um, uh, uh, TB. All right, so Phil, I'm going to hand uh, the Q and A back to you to close the session. Thanks, Kath. So J James and Miguel, thank you so much for, for a great presentation and, and a great discussion. And I, I know we ended up running over a little bit, but uh, I think it was um, very much worth it. And thanks to everyone who attended uh, uh, today and everybody who uh, was involved in preparing for this event. Um, I'd ask people on the call if they can to reach out to other US-based alumni if they're not available, if they weren't on today's session, let them know that there will be a recording available. Um, we're also going to let you know uh, of other sessions that we are planning. If anybody has any suggestions for topics that, that would, they think would be of particular interest to, to the US alumni group, um, please pass those along as well. And hopefully, uh, in the not too distant future, when this pandemic is at least under control and behind us, we can begin to, to meet again in person uh, in various events around the country, as has been the case of the past. So thank you, everyone, once again, and uh, I wish, you, wish everybody good health and happiness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.